The following sermon is presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado. We hope you'll be strengthened and encouraged by God's Word today as you listen. Well, good morning. I'd like to welcome any guests we have to Southside Bible Church. I'm Pastor Nate Thompson, and uh, one of one of the many pastors here on staff that are going to be filling in while Ken's away. So, pray that you're blessed. So speaking of guests, uh, in our travels this summer, um, my family and I met a young flight attendant who is stationed in Qatar, and she's Filipino, so her family's in the Philippines, and uh, they've been watching the live stream all the way across the world, and uh, they've been praying for Southside. And so this morning, I just wanted to give a special um, hello to her. So if you would join me in saying hello to Jermaine. So, so say hi, Jermaine. Hi, Jermaine. There you go. Very good. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. So uh, for the next four weeks, we're going to be studying the book of Habakkuk. And uh, with that in mind, let's go ahead and open in prayer. God, this is your word, and so we sit under it, and we sit in complete reliance on your spirit. May he bring forth the truth today. May we hear what you have to say. It's in your name we pray. Amen. So in the days when you could not count on public toilet facilities... An English woman was planning a trip to India. She registered to stay in a small guest house owned by a local schoolmaster. She was concerned as to whether the guest house contained a WC, a water closet. Uh, She wrote to the schoolmaster to inquire of the location of the WC. The schoolmaster, not fluent in English, asked the local priest if he knew the meaning of WC. Uh, Together, they pondered the possible meanings of the letters and concluded that the lady wanted to know if there was a wayside chapel near the house. (laughs) So that the letters WC could mean a bathroom never entered their minds. So the schoolmaster wrote, Dear Madam, I take great pleasure in informing you that the WC is located nine miles from the house. (laughs) It is located in the middle of a grove of pine trees surrounded by lovely grounds. It is capable of holding 229 people (laughs) and is open on Sundays and Thursdays. As there are many people expected in the summer months, I suggest you arrive early. There is, however, plenty of standing room. This is an unfortunate situation, especially if you are in the habit of going regularly. It may be of some interest to you that my daughter was married in the WC since she met her husband there. It was a wonderful event. There were 10 people in every seat. It was wonderful to see the expressions on their faces. My wife sadly has been ill and unable to go recently. It has been almost a year since she went last, which pains her greatly. You will be pleased to know that many people bring their lunch and make a day of it. Others prefer to wait till the last minute and arrive just in time. I would recommend to your ladyship to plan to go on Thursday, as there's an organ accompaniment. The acoustics are excellent, and even the most delicate sounds can be heard everywhere. The newest addition is a bell, which rings every time persons enter. Uh, We hold a bazaar. We're holding a bazaar to, to provide plush seats for all, since many felt it's long needed. So I look forward to escorting you there myself and seating you in a place where you can be seen by all. With deepest regard, the schoolmaster. Uh, The woman never visited India. (laughs) So you get the humor in this. This is a perfect example of misunderstanding. And as innocent as it is, um, commonly, uh, I think that people misunderstand the minor prophets, and that's what we're going to be studying. We're going to be studying a minor prophet in the book of Habakkuk for the next four weeks. So, 
reactions to this might be, oh no, why this? Or uh, can come back quickly. <laughs> so I want us to realize that this is still the word of God and it still speaks to us. And you'll find that this book is actually quoted in Acts, in Romans, in Galatians, and in Hebrews. Do you want to know where and how and when and why? Stick around. So, please give it a chance. This is God's Word. So let's just start. If you would, go ahead and turn in your Bibles to the book of Habakkuk. It's, we'll talk about that pronunciation here in a sec. Um, I know. Go ahead, look it up, get that coordinates out, get the table of contents, find that page number. It's deep in the 12, uh, the book of the 12, the 12 uh, minor prophets. So the book's author, he's mentioned in verse uh, 1 of chapter 1, he's mentioned in verse 1 of chapter 3. And as I said, the Hebrew pronunciation is Havak, Kuk, and, and the way you can, can do this, we're all going to become linguists this morning, is you can say, have a cook, go ahead, have a cook. Okay, that's a nice English phrase, right? Have a cook. Let's try it again. Okay, now, that A in the have a cook, we're going we're gonna to change that to an ack. Okay, I know that's a very natural sounding sound. Ack. Okay, so you're just going to substitute that A for ack. Okay, so we're going to try that sentence again with an ack. Ready? Have ack cook. Okay, and that... You just ooh out that kook and you got it. Is that all right? So let's try it. Have ak kook. There you go. Your linguists make your rabbi proud. Okay. So the uh, so English letter substitution. If you look at it in your phonetics books, probably hey back cook, but phonics never touched. Talk to me about double K's and ooh sounds with U's, and this is weird. So um, uh, if you like Habakkuk or Habakkuk or Habakkuk, it's fine. We all know what we're talking about. Um, his name, it means to embrace. So um, you can have fun with that with your spouse during this four-week period. Habakkuk, my little... I don't know, <laughs> falafel, my little knish, or, or however you want to ham it up for, for Jewish means. So, so there you go. So it means to embrace, and this is why um, some people believe that, this, that he is the boy spoken of in 2 Kings 4.16 by Elisha the prophet who's speaking to the Shumanite woman saying, uh, you will embrace a son. Um, and that's, that's great, but the problem is it doesn't work from a timeline perspective. It's, it's nice, we like stuff like that, but it just doesn't work well there. Uh, it's apparent that he is a prophet. It's, that's mentioned explicitly. Um, not all of the prophets are stated in the book as prophets. He is, quite clearly. And then the other thing that we know about him, so we know very few things about him because this is all we have on him. The other thing that we know about him is in chapter 3, you'll notice that there's phrasing that's surrounding music. And um, in 3.1, it mentions uh, a kind of musical state. It's like an adagio or, or what have you. And we'll talk about that when we get to chapter three, Lord willing. And, and then at the very end of the book, in, in, in 3.19, it says, for the choir director on the stringed instrument. So he seems to have some familiarity with music. And chapter three in general was meant to be accompanied with music. So um, from that, some have speculated that maybe he was in the priesthood and he um, was a part of the music worship in that, if, if that's the case. So um, we don't know, maybe, maybe not, but he some, seems to have some, some uh, uh, familiarity with it. So uh, when, when was this written? Uh, best we can tell, it was uh, written during the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah. 
So that'd be toward the very end of the seventh century BC, very beginning of the sixth century BC. So we get that from uh, verses like 1 6, mentioning the Babylonians, Chaldeans, we'll talk about that. Two, and then uh, uh, chapter 2, verses 2 through 3, um, that uh, they were coming swiftly. Um, and then 316, they were coming. This event looks like it's going to come in the prophet's lifetime. So I say king of Judah, and I know I'm not going to expect everybody to be familiar with how this works historically. Uh, is the king of Judah the king of Israel? Well, no, not really. Here's what happened. Uh, the first king of Israel was Saul, not a great king, but king nonetheless. The king that you're going to be familiar with was his successor, David, King David. I'm sure that's what most people are familiar with. King David reigned. He was a man after God's own heart. Didn't mean he was perfect. He was a sinner. He made plenty of mistakes, but he was a man after God's own heart. He ruled and reigned well. Then his son, Solomon, took his place, succeeded him as king. He reigned uh, fairly well. He had his, his issues as well. And then after Solomon's passing, his son Rehoboam took his place. And it's at this point that we get a major split in, um, in Israel's history. Rehoboam um, made, makes a very bad decision, forces the people into a, a very difficult situation, and 10 of the tribes of the nation of Israel, there are 12, 10 of the tribes say, we're done, we're leaving, and they go and seek out an, a once exiled general named Jeroboam. I know phonetically Jeroboam and Rehoboam sound the same. They are not brothers. They, uh, they're, they're quite different people. And so Jeroboam was the first king of the northern king of Israel, northern kingdom of Israel, known as the kingdom of Israel commonly. And then Rehoboam continued as the king of Judah or the southern kingdom of Israel. All right, so there was a split. And all the kings of Israel, coming from Jeroboam all the way through their history, were wicked kings. They were evil kings. Not a one of them followed God. Not a one. Until their captivity, they were carried away in captivity, conquered and carried away in uh, captivity uh, uh, to Assyria in, a, in around 722 BC. So that's the northern kingdom. Okay? Now, Judah had a different story. It, it starts with Rehoboam and moves forward. Here's what's critical about this. Under the Davidic covenant, God promised that he would preserve an heir from the line of David on the throne of Israel. Who comes from that line that's critical? The Messiah, Jesus Christ himself. So it's, so it's critical that, that that line is maintained and that, that uh, God keeps his promise, and he does. So every king of Judah is in the line of David, is, is there. There was one little hiccup in there with a queen, Athaliah. She was a peach. Look it up. So um, uh, they were not brought into captivity under the Assyrian Empire um, through a very miraculous event. And uh, God preserved them all the way until the Babylonian captivity in 605 BC. So, um, or that's, sorry, it's a little after that. The Babylonians rose to power around that time. So we'll see all of this kind of unfold. This timeline and how things are going matters quite a bit. Um, so what, what's, uh, what's the message? Well, uh, the prophet was to proclaim judgment to Judah. Um, and he was uh, one of the minor prophets in concert with a major prophet, Jeremiah. Uh, uh, Habakkuk was the last uh, minor prophet until um, Judah went into captivity under Babylon. Jeremiah actually uh, continues some of the history as he goes through. So uh, where did all this take place? as is implied in the southern kingdom in Judah. So um, modern-day Israel uh, kind of expands close to what the kingdom was back then, the full kingdom, the combination of both north and south. Um, so the kingdom, if you've got a map in your Bible, the kingdom of Judah, kind of northern tip Jericho down to Kadesh Barnea. I know, you, I know you're familiar with your Jewish geography, so that'll help. And then... Um, 
Uh, if he was involved in the priestly service, he probably lived somewhere close to Jerusalem, and Jerusalem was the capital city of Judea. So why? So we've got who, what, when, where, why. We're asking all of our good uh, newspaper questions. Quite simply, the book puts God on display. It does, and you'll, you'll see that. That's something special about the minor prophets that I think too many people breeze through in their uh, read the Bible in a year Bible apps. You just, oh, I gotta get through this, read through it, hold my breath, don't know what any of this means, and you get through it. But the problem is you're also missing out on the picture of a very, very beautiful God, and he is put on display, and his faithfulness is put on display in this book as well. So we're gonna, we have an outline that we're going to be going through, and I'll just introduce this morning. We're going to be looking at chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. Chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. And the outline that I'm going to use, and I'll explain why I'm using this, because it's a little bit different than the outlines I've used in the past, is um, the prophet praying, praying through injustice, verses 1 through 4, praying through injustice. Um, Verses 1 through 2, crying for salvation. Verse 3, crying against wickedness. And verse 4, crying against injustice. And then uh, verses verses, uh, 5 through 11, God on display, his sovereignty, his omniscience, and his justice. Um, Verses uh, 5 through 6a, his sovereignty, Verses uh, 6b through 10, his omniscience, and verse 11, his justice. So we're going to put these things on display this morning. So if you would look with me. The oracle of Habakkuk, the prophet, saw. So verse 1, here's what I want us to notice. Um, NASB says the oracle, um, and... Uh, the, the word is Massah in Hebrew, Massah, and it actually means, uh, it talks about what is to be lifted up um, or what is burdensome or a burden. So some of you in your uh, translations, you might have the burden which Habakkuk the prophet saw. Okay, and that's probably more accurate to what is being displayed. Yes, um, oracle in the sense of a forelooking, um, which is probably why the uh, NASB um, Lockman Foundation translated it this way. This is not wholly incorrect, but burden is probably better because what you're going to see in what he saw was indeed a burden. It was a burden that he had to bear and that he had to continue to bear as he bore it to those around him. So that's probably a better translation, a burden, which Habakkuk, and that says the prophet saw. Usually in all the prophetic books like uh, Jonah or um, uh, other of the um, minor prophet books, uh, usually it says the word of the Lord came to such and such the prophet. That's usually the way that goes. In, in this, it says, he saw, he saw, which, which tends to indicate that it's a vision. And, and so we're thinking um, through, through seeing. Well, through seeing, it wouldn't be, it wasn't a silent movie, so don't think of it as a silent movie, that it's just things he saw. There were things that he would have heard as well in the seeing, but he saw visions, and that's why as he's describing some of these things um, and what he saw, it's, uh, that's why he can be so picturesque in his description of what's going to happen, what's going to transpire. Okay, so let's, let's look at this burden that he has. Verses 2 through 4, it says, How long, O Lord, will I call for help? And you will not hear. I cry out to you, violence, yet you do not save Why do you make me see iniquity and cause me to look on wickedness? Yes, destruction and violence are before me. Strife exists and contention arises. Therefore, the law is ignored and justice is never upheld for the wicked surround the righteous. Therefore, justice comes out perverted. 
So if you look at this, it's, it's quite an intense prayer. What he's seeing is very awful. And what's unfolding is horrible. And um, what we need to understand is the king Jehoiakim was not a good king. He was not a godly king. And therefore, what was unfolding before them, what he was seeing, probably on a daily basis, was all of these things. And he's crying out to God. And he's saying, how long? And what I want us to first kind of observe in, in this list is you can run down these things and it's, and it's really easy to lock in on a few things and, and sweep past a couple of others. And, and let me tell you why, why this is the case, because this is the way we are. When it comes to lists of bad things, we tend to focus in on the really bad things, or what we determine the really bad things, and make that what it's about so that this isn't talking about me, right? So the words that jump out, the first one that jumps out is violence, um, the Hebrew word is Hamas, it's, that's, which is really interesting um, because that's a Hebrew word, okay? Hamas is a Hebrew word and it means violence. And there is a Palestinian group whose initials spell out Hamas. Now, they're not Hebrew, right? So they speak Arabic but their letters spell out Hamas. If you've heard that word Hamas on television, it's that group. And I don't think it's coincidental that they kind of chose that because they hate the Jews. They hate Israel. And so that would, that would flange up with the Hebrew word for violence. Violence. So that word jumps out, violence. Um, iniquity, wickedness, destruction, violence again, strife and contention, um, justice is ignored, wicked surround the righteous, etc. Justice comes out perverted. Here's what I blew past. Strife and contention. Strife and contention. In Proverbs 10, 12, we're told that hatred stirs up strife. In Galatians 5.20, it lists the deed of, deeds of the flesh. Strife is in there. Titus 3.9, we're instructed to avoid those people who stir up strife. Strife and contention. We blow past these because we tend to do these things. We tend to be those who are strife people, argumentative, combative, and in 1 Timothy 3 and in Titus 1, an elder, one of the qualifications of an elder is one who is not a striker, a fighter, a quarreler. So this, this is something important. So I, what I don't want us to do is look at this list, say it's all about these other things, not the strife and contention, so that it's not about, so it's not kind of putting the focus on me. Am I a person of strife? Am I a person of contention? If I am, you would be like this group. Yeah, sure, you're not beating people up, maybe not, but possibly quite a lot with your words. So let's not excuse ourselves here. So that I, I don't say that's not me. All right, so... Verse 4, it says, therefore. So what's therefore? Therefore, that means what's, what's mentioned, what, what's aforementioned is causal. All right, so all of this stuff, this violence, this wickedness, this destruction, this strife and contention, therefore the law is ignored. And we're not talking about, are there traffic laws ignored? Are there um, dietary laws ignored? This is, when they spoke of the law, they spoke of, and the, and the Hebrew word is the Torah, the law of God. So it's, it's the holistic, it's all of this, and it's God's law saying, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. These commands, 
the law is ignored. Why is it ignored? Because it's now become about me, and it's become about the person who screams the loudest, who hits the hardest, who pays the most money, who makes the best argument, right? When you dismiss truth, it becomes about any number of other things, right? I I hope, does does this sound a little bit like today? Are are you seeing it? It's, It's interesting that this book was written thousands of years ago. Man hasn't changed a bit. And we shouldn't be shocked because sin has been a problem since Genesis 3. And it just produces the exact same garbage over and over again, just in more creative ways. So if you find that this is applicable, that this looks like today, and that, that you and I are crying out against wickedness, against violence. And we're saying, how long, O Lord? It it begs the question, as I look at this text, what can I observe about it holistically? Is a prophet complaining against God and saying, "Um, God, what are you doing? Is he doing that? Or is it something else? And if you look with me at, at Psalms 13, the 13th Psalm, And let's look at verses 1 and 2. We'll hold there. And then we'll read the rest of the psalm. It's not a very long one. Okay. Psalm 13 says, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart all the day? How long will my enemy be exalted over me? Does this sound similar? Does this sound similar? I, I hope you see that it does. And if, if you've got a heading, it's, it probably says a prayer of David or a prayer of David for help or prayer for help, right? This is a prayer. This is a prayer. What I, what I would consider as a possibility here is in chapter one of Hab, Habakkuk is a prayer. It's a prayer. And And some people just say, well, this is a conversation. Well, you call it a conversation because you see that God answers in reply. The prophet wasn't necessarily expecting a reply. So when you are talking to God, what is that called? I think it's basic root. It's called a prayer. You're praying. Yeah, there's different types of prayers. And here's here's an example of a prayer for David. Now, we tend to give David in Psalm 13 a pass. Why? Because it continues. Um, He says, consider and answer me, O O my God, enlighten my eyes, or I will sleep in the sleep of death. And my enemy will say, I have overcome him, and my adversary will rejoice when I am shaken. That sounds horrible, and it sounds very much like what we're reading here. But then look at verses 5 and 6. But I have trusted in your loving kindness. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. The reason why we typically give a pass to this is because of these last two verses where he says, I trust in God. So that's why he's not put as a complainer. All right, fair enough. Okay, now let's turn back to the prophet. And, and we don't see that here, does that necessarily mean that he's a complainer? Well, a lot of commentators do slap that on and say he is. He's a complainer. That's, that's who he is. Well, yes, it can be complaining. Here's the problem. Um, we need to be careful if he is, lest we find ourselves looking at a passage like this as an excuse to complain against God. After all... And, you know, Havakuk, verses, you know, chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, the prophet's complaining to God, and so it's okay to complain. Well, I would have you read Numbers 11 and read how God thinks of complainers. It doesn't end well. And I would tell you that, no, complaining's not good. It's not okay. So if this is sinful complaining... This isn't justified complaining, and and the prophet's 
heart is not in the right place. I don't think that's where it is. I think he knows God too well. So there is another way of looking at this. And if you look at Ephesians 4, 25 through 27, you, there's a command there that says, be angry and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. There's an instruction. And if you take in the whole context of Ephesians 4, there's this instruction. Don't look at sin and go, no big deal. He says, be angry about this. Be passionate about this. Now, there's also the instruction, don't let the sun go down on your anger. This shouldn't be a perpetual thing. I'm constantly, perpetually, godly angry. You know, and we love that. That's a great excuse for us to go around as, as a mean, nasty individual, but it's also an excuse and it doesn't fit the context of Ephesians 4. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. It's a choice. So this prophet may very well be choosing to be angry about God's defamation. Because where does it wrap up in verse 4? Therefore the law is ignored and justice is never upheld for the wicked surround the righteous. Therefore justice comes out perverted. It's a distortion of the character of God. And the nation of Israel was supposed to represent and represent well the God of the Bible. They were not doing it. They were not doing it. And keep in mind, the prophet knew about this God and the way he saved. Here's examples. In 2 Kings 19, it chronicles how God saved the southern kingdom, the nation of Judah, quite physically and literally from the Assyrians. The angel of the Lord, probably the pre-incarnate Christ, went in in one night and killed 185,000 soldiers of the Assyrians. Those who were left got up the next morning and went, whoa, and left, as you and I would, right? And so the, the, the armies of, of Judah did nothing. They didn't raise a finger. God fought for them very literally and saved them very literally. The prophet would know of this. He'd be familiar with this. This wasn't too far back in their history. So there was physical salvation. There was physical justice because the, uh, the Assyrian um, general was wagging his head at Judah. Huh, huh, huh. You trust in your God. Your God's not going to save you. And God showed up in a big way. Okay? He'd be familiar with that. He was also familiar with Manasseh, who was a very, very wicked king of the nation. And if you read in 2 Chronicles 33, God brought him to a place of repentance. He turned him. And he then, that the, the king, returned and sought reformation, sought to reform the, uh, the nation. And then he's also, the prophet would be familiar with King Josiah, who found the book of the law and was so overcome by it that he reformed all of Israel, all of Judah. So he was familiar with all these things. He knew how God acted. So it's very easy, um, if you put yourself in his shoes, for him to see these things and, and basically cry out, God, save, change, reform. So we pick it up in verse 5 where he's going to get a response. And, and this is what it says. Look among the nations, observe, be astonished, wonder. Pause. Stop right there. I want us to stop right there. Because this is going to tell us something about the way our prayer lives go. Have you ever prayed to God with a thought of, this is how he's going to answer it. This is how he's going to answer it. And it's going to be amazing. The guy that cut me on traffic, he's going to explode into a ball of fire. (laughs) And that will proclaim the justice of God. No. Okay, That's, that's a bit hyperbolic of an example, but maybe some of you follow me. So, if I pause here just for a minute, 
Look among the nations, observe, be astonished, wonder. And, and just pause. Maybe the prophet's going, oh yeah, all right, good, bring it on, bring it on. The reform and all the bad guys going away, amen, amen. And that's not where it goes. So I, I just want to take that for a minute for us to observe our prayer lives. When we're praying, are you praying to a God who is God or are you praying to a God who is a genie? Grant my wish. It's bad. I'm uncomfortable. Please bring me back to the comfort zone. Because God won't answer that prayer. Because that's not what godliness is. If you're a child of God and you're praying that, he's not going to answer that prayer because it's not going to bring about Christ in you. So let's be careful about things of that nature. So, be astonished, wonder. Because I am doing something in your days, so it's going to happen in your time, you would not believe if, I were to, if you were told. It, it's going to blow your mind. For behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, that fierce and impetuous people who march throughout the earth to seize dwelling places which are not theirs. Okay, not quite what he was looking for. This is a group that he would be familiar with, given the timeline. He knew what they were. He knew what they were capable of doing. And God's going to describe in detail who these people are. And so I'm going to take us through verse 11, and I'm going to explain to you what these uh, visions, these pictures mean. Okay? So he says he's raising up the Chaldeans. He calls them fierce and impetuous. That means they're, they strike terror into the heart of the people that they're in. Um, they, they're impetuous, they, they move forward, they, they go off of their impulses, who march throughout the earth to seize dwelling places which are not theirs, meaning they're not sticking around in their own country, they're going out and they are taking down other nations. And uh, they uh, took down the Assyrian nation, who uh, the prophet would be familiar with um, in the bat Battle of uh, Kirkamesh. And uh, that's what really put them on the national scene in familiarity with everybody there at the time. Because if they could take down the Assyrians, and the Assyrians were number one at the time, were the, were the big kid on the block, if they could slap that bully down then they were the new bully on the block. And they were the new bully on the block. So here's things that they knew about them. Um, they are, verse 7, they are dreaded and feared. Their justice and authority originates with themselves. Meaning, um, and, and the familiarity would be from uh, his mindset, is they're not looking to God in this. They're looking to themselves in this. They see themselves as the authority and they will do as they please. Verse 8, their horses are swifter than leopards. So it's a description of an um, army that moves quickly. And keener than wolves in the evening. Um, so uh, if you're not familiar with your neighborhood wolf, they uh, come out at night and that's when they are hunting. That's when their, uh, their senses are, are on their keenest. Um, I live a little out in the country and somewhere around well, 11 o'clock at night, we hear a big old pack of coyotes coming by. Yep, 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 yep. And they're just all lighting each other up because they're all excited because they're out to go kill, basically. That's what they're going to go do. Rabbits, bunnies, whatever. Um, so uh, they're keener than wolves in the evening, so they're focused in on their target. Their horsemen come galloping. Uh, so so uh, they don't go about things gradually. They're, they're in a hurry. Their horsemen come from afar. Um, Babylon, uh, Babylonia is in modern-day Iraq. All right? And so if you know your geography, where Israel is and where Iraq is, they're not, you know, oh, he's just around the block. Well, I mean, from a plane flight perspective, sure, but they didn't have planes. They had horses. 
And, and so they're coming, they're coming with intent. They come from uh, modern-day Iraq, from the east. Um, the horsemen come from afar. They fly like an eagle swooping down to devour. Have you ever seen a, an eagle attack? Bald eagle? You've probably seen a hawk, maybe, or some bird of prey. Uh, when they target in on what it is that they're, they're about to get as their next meal, uh, they do a they nosedive, and um, some birds of prey can reach in excess of 100 miles an hour. It's very, so they, they're on it quick. That's, that's the explanation. That's how they're being described. So they're, they're terrible. They're terrible. They're merciless. All of them come for violence. Okay, Hamas, same thing. Uh, and and um, thank you. That's, you know, thank you for the comforting words. I'm talking to you about my people being violent, and now you're encouraging me with a people that are violent. Their horde of faces moves forward. They collect captives like sand. So um, they sweep in basically like a desert wind. Some of you might have that translation. And it says they collect captives like sand. Well, what's that mean? Um, whenever sand is used, it's used as a, a means of describing an uncountable amount. So it's they're coming in and they're, they're getting big numbers of people, okay? So they carry away large numbers of people. Okay, they mock at kings and rulers are a laughing matter to them. The, uh, the strongest um, portion of the army was supposed to be the king and his strength, and it says they laugh at them, they mock them. Um, Zedekiah, the king of Judah, uh, you can read about this lovely event in uh, 2 Kings, um, the Babylonians killed his sons in front of him and then put out his eyes and carried him away to captivity. They were cruel. They were very cruel. And that describes the way they thought of kings and rulers. That's what they did. They just mocked them. And that's the ultimate of mocking. How would you like to be that to be your last thing that you saw and then kept alive. That's what they did. That's how violent and vile they were. And then the end of uh, verse 10, they laugh at every fortress and heap up rubble to capture it. So um, it means that uh, if you, and, and in this era they were, if you were very confident in your ability to lock yourself up inside of your fortress and you had plenty of food and water and you took confidence in that fortress, um, hey, they can't get to us. The Babylonians were the ones that really started perfecting siege, uh, instruments of siege and warfare. And what they, one of the things they would do is, as described, they would heap up rubble, stone, dirt, until they had a ramp up to the top of the wall, and everyone would go up over the ramp into the city and take it. And so you couldn't do anything about it. And then they, uh, eventually they, have, they uh, uh, started to create the siege ramp, the one that they would roll up, hook up on the wall, and go in and take you. So your, your comforts of your big, strong city with its big, thick, you know, X-foot walls weren't anything to them. They laughed at it. And then verse 11, then they will sweep through like the wind and pass on. Meaning, they're going to take you, they're going to get you, they're going to take you into captivity, and they're not going to give a second thought about you because they're going to move on to the next person and the next person. So you aren't even a thought to them. You're not uh, a worry to them. And then the very end of verse 11, but they will be held guilty, they whose strength is their God. So what can I glean from this, because this sounds like the exact opposite of what the prophet was asking for. There's wickedness. There's evil. God, do something. Correct this. Correct my country. Correct my people. Correct my nation. And God said, I will. I'm going to send in the Babylonians, and they're going to judge you, and it's going to deal with your wickedness because all of you are going to be prisoners. Those of you who survive, those who aren't killed, you'll be prisoners. Does that sound 
encouraging? So what I want us to see is the prophet sees evil, sees wickedness, and is crying for God, please answer. And, and just like the prophet, too often we become so overwhelmed with what's around us, the injustice, the wickedness, the evil, the sin, that we miss who God is in it. So if you look with me at, at these passages, in verse 5 he says, look among the nations and observe. First of all, he's having the prophet get out of his small focus and he says, I want you to look at the bigger picture because there's something happening on the national world level. And he then says in verse 6, for behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans. Don't miss the I. God's saying, I'm doing this. That is a sovereignty statement. I'm doing this. I'm the one that's raising them up. And I'm raising them up and I'm using them to my purpose. It sounds horrific, but you need to understand I'm God, I'm sovereign, I'm in control, and I'm doing a work that's even beyond Judah, that's a world view. He's making a big picture. Then, you might notice, he, God goes on from the second part of verse 6 all the way to the first part of verse 11 and describes these people in detail. And you might say, as you know, might I, this is too much information. You don't need to tell me how bad these people are. Can you leave that part out? But he includes it because what this is demonstrating is God's declaring, I am omniscient. I know what I'm doing because it might beg the question, if this wasn't there, wait a minute, you're sending the Chaldeans? Do you know who they are? Do you know what they do? And God says, I know exactly who they are, and I know exactly what they do. God declares himself omniscient. I'm sovereign. I'm omniscient. Very, very end of verse 11, he says, but they will be held guilty, they whose strength is their God. Very subtly, he's saying, I'm just. They're not going to get away with it. I'm going to judge them. I'm going to judge them just like I'm judging you. I'm using them to judge you, and I will judge them as well. They won't get a pass. I'm still in charge, and justice has not escaped my notice. They think their strength is their God. He's going to show the whole world, not just Judah, that he Elohim, Yahweh, is God. He is God. So when we're in prayer, and when we're praying, just like the prophet, and we're saying, God, it's bad, it's horrible, it's awful, first, let's check our motives. Are, are we praying for the right thing? Are we praying this with God at the center of it? And then, secondly, am I hopeless in this? Or am I looking to God as who he has declared himself to be, as the sovereign, as the all-knowing, as the just, as the wise God? Or have I lost sight of this? And all too often when we're in just the pits, we're just... Oh, how can it get any worse or how could it possibly be better? It's because we've lost sight of who's actually on the throne. And I think that's exactly what God is doing to the prophet in response to his prayer is no, it's not a quid 
pro quo, tit for tat response to do this, do that. And now I'm going to respond in this way. The prophet says, I've got a problem. And God's response is, got it. I'm God. I'm God. And our comfort should come from the fact that he is God and not our circumstances. So I close with this, a poem on prayer. It says, make me an intercessor, one who can really pray one of the Lord's remembrances by night as well as day. Make me an intercessor in spirit touch with thee and give the heavenly vision praying through to victory. Make me an intercessor, teach me how to prevail, to stand my ground and still pray on the powers of hell assail. Make me an intercessor, sharing thy death and life, in prayer claiming for others victory in the strife. Make me an intercessor, willing for deeper death, death, emptied, broken, then made anew, and filled with living breath. Make me an intercessor, hidden, unknown, set apart, Though little of, uh, thought little of by those around, but satisfying thine heart. Let's pray. God, again, this is your word. And though written thousands of years ago by a prophet we probably think not very much about, it's still your word and it still rings true. The world is the world, and sin is sin, and my circumstances are what they are because you have so declared them to be. May I, may your people kneel and acknowledge you as God, that we would look to you and you alone as our rock, as our fortress, as our strength, and not our own, and not our own invention, but that we would rely on you. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. The preceding message was presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado, and we hope you've been challenged and encouraged to grow in your relationship with Christ. Each week, our sermons are made available online and may be downloaded and distributed. If you have questions or comments or would like to speak to one of our pastors, please contact us through our website at southsidebible.org.